Well, today, uh, I guess we're celebrating Easter. Uh, it is Easter in September. <laughs> And we are celebrating Easter because we're coming down to the end. We're in chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be picking up in verse 1, and we're going to be going down to verse 8. And so we're going to take a look at this Easter story. Uh, this is the story of the resurrection. This is the story of the empty tomb. This is a story that many of you have heard over and over and over again. And like we have said before, when we come to a passage of Scripture that we have heard before, that we have read before, that we have studied before, it's very important for us to approach it as best as we can with fresh eyes, uh, with an open mind, with open ears and an open heart. Um, it's very easy for us to take a look at Scripture and say, oh, I've been there, done that, already read that, I'll skip over it. Don't do that. Because the, the word of God is living. It's, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It, it'll, it'll cut you down deep into your soul, deeper every single time you encounter it. It's something that is to be experienced over and over again. It's something that speaks to us in new ways because we find ourselves with new ears. Uh, the last time you heard this story, the last time you studied this story, you were in a different place in your life. You probably were not in a pandemic. You probably were not dealing dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life right now. Now you're a little bit different. You've got some different perspectives. You've got some different uh, leanings that you will now bring to this passage. And because of that, this word will be opened up to you. God's word doesn't change in the sense that the words on the page change. But God's word changes in your heart because your heart changes. God's word changes in your life because your life changes. And it opens you up to new kinds of ways. It opens you up to uh, new, new perspectives. It opens you up to new uh, revelation. And so when we read a story like this, a story of the resurrection, a story that we've heard many times before, uh, it's an opportunity for us to be open to what God's going to do in a new way with us. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 16. We're going to read down from verses 1 to verse 8, and then we're going to go back and take a look at it. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Thanks be to God for the reading of this word. This is Mark's account of the resurrection. We have four accounts of the resurrection, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we've talked about this before, that it gives us a perfect 360-degree view of that actual event. And so here we will get Mark's perspective. So again, like in other stories, I'm going to ask you for this study is that you remember what Matthew, Luke, and John said about the resurrection, but you don't impart that onto Mark's words. Allow Mark's words to hit you fresh. Allow Mark's words to speak to you just what they're saying without all the other stuff coming in. I know it's hard to do because you've heard this story in so many different forms. And we're going to take a look just specifically at this story from Mark's perspective and take a look at it from Mark's eyes, uh, from Mark's hand, and also too from Mark's community, who he's talking to, who he's sharing this message with. So we're going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, when the Sabbath was over, and so we understand now the time frame is that it is Saturday night after sundown. For the Sabbath goes Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. So this is Saturday night after sundown. The Sabbath is over. If remember, last week we left off with Joseph of Arimathea placing Jesus in the tomb, wrapping him in some linen, placing him in the tomb, rolling the stone in front of the tomb, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of, of, of John 
Mary, Mary, the mother of, yeah, Mary, the mother of Joseph, sorry, Mary, the mother of Joseph was there and they were witnessing this. So they knew where the tomb was and they also knew that his body had not been properly prepared because remember, he was dead on the cross around three o'clock. He had to be in the tomb before sunset Friday because that was the beginning of the Sabbath and you couldn't do anything, any work on the Sabbath. So he had to be in the tomb before sunset on the Sabbath on Friday night. So now we have the whole day of Saturday has passed. It's sunset Saturday night. And it says, when the Sabbath was over, sunset Saturday night, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might anoint Jesus's body. They bought spices so they might anoint Jesus's body. And this is significant because of the fact that, again, last week, we noticed that Joseph of Arimathea did not have a chance to properly prepare the body. In Jewish custom, when a body is prepared for burial, it is anointed with spices, it's anointed with oil. It's not like Egyptians where they mummify the body, but they do prepare the body and then they wrap the body. Excuse me, they wrap the body in linen. And so they saw that Jesus had been wrapped in linen, but they did not see him be anointed uh, to be prepared with the spices. And so they wanted to do that. So what they did is they waited till sunset on Saturday, which was the end of the Sabbath. Thus, they could go out to the marketplace and they could buy the spices. So when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the, the mother of James and Salome, all three had witnessed his, his crucifixion. Now they were going to go and prepare his body. All three of them bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus's body. They might go and anoint Jesus's body. Now this is interesting because if you might remember earlier in chapter 14, we have a reference to Jesus's body already being anointed. So let's turn back to Mark chapter 14 and we're gonna look at verse eight. So go ahead and keep your hand there at 16 and we're gonna go back to 14. We're gonna look at verse eight. Mark 14 verse eight. Mark 14, verse 8, and this is the story of Jesus in Bethany. And this is the story. He's having dinner, and a woman comes and anoints him. And the disciples get all mad because she uses a, a, a jar of pure nard, which is very valuable. And the disciples are saying, why did, you, why did she waste it on pouring it over Jesus' head when we could have sold it and fed the poor? And this is Jesus' res response to them in chapter 14, verse 8. Chapter 14, verse 8. She did this in the words of Jesus. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial, to prepare for my burial. And back in chapter 14, when we studied that, we said that was a very interesting um, comment that Jesus made there. In fact, it was so off the wall and so different that the disciples really didn't pick up on it uh, because there's no comment. They didn't say, whoa, 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 time out. What do you mean she anointed you for your burial? They just kept went on grumbling about the fact that they could have sold that pure nard for a lot of money and, and fed a lot of poor people. But Jesus, in essence, back in chapter 14, was already anointed in Bethany. His body was already prepared. He had made a reference to this time when Joseph of Arimathea was going to be laying him in the tomb, and he wasn't going to anoint his body. He wasn't going to have time to prepare his body. But, of course, the women want to take care of this. The women want to make sure. The women want to pay him honor and respect. Now, many times we have to remember and understand that when it comes to memorial services, when it comes to funerals, when it comes to celebrations of life, it's not for the person because they are dead and gone. They have gone to glory. It's for all of us that are left. And so when the women go to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body to anoint him with the oil and the spices, they're not doing it for him because he's dead. They're doing it for themselves because they want to show some kind of respect. They want to show some kind of love. They want to do something to honor him. And that's the same way that we all go through this process of grief. Uh, we want to do something to remember that person, to honor that person, even though we know in our heart of hearts that person's in a much better place and we're not doing it for them. We're really doing it for us. And this is where the, the women are. They want to do this to Jesus, but for themselves and their grieving process to show honor and respect. So very early on the first day of the week, so they didn't go immediately. They didn't go after sunset on Saturday, buy the spices and head to the tomb. Um, for who wants to be messing with a tomb at night? Not me, and obviously not those ladies. They didn't want to go to the, to the tomb at night and get in there and take care of his body. They wanted to wait till daylight. They wanted to wait till the break of dawn. And so very early on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, 
just after sunrise. They were on their way to the tomb. So they waited for the sun to rise on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. The Sabbath was over. They've already bought the spices. They've got everything prepared. And they're heading out to go to the tomb to prepare his body. The sun has just risen. And on, in verse, in verse uh, 3 here it says, And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? There's an old saying in the Bible that says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be. And here is three ladies that are gathered in the name of Jesus. And God is there. God is present. So in essence, when they're having this conversation, this isn't just them pondering to each other. This is just them just questioning each other. This is them lifting up a prayer. This is a prayer. Prayer doesn't always have to be knees bent, um, head bowed, and eyes closed. Uh, prayer doesn't always have to be complete sentences. Uh, prayer comes in many different forms. Prayer is a conversation. And here these women are gathered and they're going, getting ready to worship, to pay honor to Jesus. And they have lifted up a concern to each other, but also too to the ears of God. That's a prayer. So um, we, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Look at verse four. What does it begin with? But, pay attention to the buts in the Bible. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. So when they looked up, they are asking themselves the question, who will roll the stone away? And then they looked up, almost in a sense, not just to look towards the tomb, but also look up, meaning they're getting ready to cast up a prayer. Oh, dear Lord, help us. Help us with this stone. They're, they're looking up towards the heavens. But what do they find when they look up? They find that the stone has already been rolled away. So in essence, while they were traveling to the tomb with the concern of who will roll the stone away, God had already taken care of the prayer. And that happens so many times in our lives that God takes care of the things that we need even before we know we need them. God takes care of uh, the desires of our hearts before we even realize they're desires of our hearts. Uh, God knows the way. God knows the, the direction. God knows the needs. And he fulfills those things even before we know them. And so in essence, this is important for us to remember when we come to the Lord in prayer. When we come to the Lord in prayer, we're not asking for something that doesn't already exist. We're simply acknowledging and thanking God for that which exists. We just don't know it yet. And that's a different perspective on prayer. And this is where the women are. They're asking each other, how are we going to roll the stone away when the whole time God's already taken care of it? The stone's already been rolled away. It was rolled away before they even spoke the words. And it's the same in your prayer life and in my prayer life. When we go to God with a need, God's already fulfilled that need. God's already filled that need. God's already touched that need, whatever the case may be. We just now need to acknowledge it. We just now need to recognize it. We just now need to live into it. So our prayer life is more of a thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for revealing to me that which I don't know yet. Thank you, God, for showing me that which I haven't seen yet. Thank you, God, for doing something which I haven't even realized I have to have it be done yet. And so this is an aspect of prayer that's very important for us to comprehend. So they looked up and they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And we have a very uh, important note here by Mark because he tells us something about the stone. Yes, it was very large. But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away, had been rolled away. Now, the thing that's interesting for all you English people, uh, English, in, English studiers, studiers of language, is that in the Greek, this had been rolled away is what they call the divine passive. That's the tense that, that those words are in, the divine passive, which means it is, a, it is something that had been done from outside of themselves. Um, it's something that had been done by not only outside of themselves, but had been done by God. So this was something that God did. God rolled the stone away even before they knew that they needed the stone to be rolled away. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So they see the stone rolled away. They're like, oh, wow, this is great. This is convenient. But also, too, they probably were questioning, why is the stone rolled away? What's going on here? So even before they entered the tomb, there was a hermeneutic of suspicion that was happening inside them. They were thinking to themselves, something's going on here. This, this stone should not be rolled away, but it is. 
So let's go in and check out. So they go into the tomb to check it out. And it's interesting because Mark describes the person that they find in the tomb. How does Mark describe that person? He describes him as a young man dressed in a white robe. Listen to the words again. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. It doesn't say they saw an angelic figure. It doesn't say that they saw the, the gardener or the keeper of the tombs. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe. Now, the significance of the white robe is important because uh, white represents things like um, glory and resurrection and purity and salvation. And so there's an angelic reference here. I think it would be very easy for us to, to make this connection, that, that jump to say that this was an angel that was there. Mark doesn't make that jump for us. Um, we, we make that jump. We look at this and we understand that as scripture has taught us that sometimes we entertain angels unaware. And so many times we will have an angelic visit and we won't really realize it's an angel at that time. Because remember, angels are very scary beings. Anytime we have somebody encounter an angel in scripture, um, they are struck with fear. They're overcome with, with awe and wonder and they, they find themselves afraid. Now the, the women find themselves amazed and afraid at this time, but it's for something different. And let's take a look at that. As they entered the, to the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe and he was standing on the right side. Important because the right side is the side of favor. It is the side of, of strength. Um, right side is the, the side of honor. And so he's not on the left side, he's on the right side. And so this is a young man dressed in white on the right side, on the right side. And, um, and they were alarmed. Do you have alarmed in your translations? You might have a different word. You might have amazed, uh, they were scared, they were terrified, whatever the case may be. There's many different words that you can use to, to define this Greek term that was used here. Um, Mark, in this passage, in this NIV translation, they choose to use the word alarmed. Now, why were they alarmed? Number one, they were alarmed because the stone had been rolled away. They didn't expect that. Number two, they were alarmed because there's this young guy inside the tomb all dressed in white. This is kind of weird. Um, and third, they're alarmed because on a very basic human level <clears throat> right now reality is flipped upside down right now truth is kind of gone because they saw Jesus die on the cross they two of them at least saw Joseph of Arimathea put Jesus's body in that very tomb and they saw the stone rolled in front now who they thought was dead is not there because the tomb was empty except for this young man dressed in white. So right now in this moment as this is happening, it didn't take very long for them to walk in the tomb to see this and to, to kind of kind of put this input this into their brain. And it's all confused. It's, it's like mush in there now because what they thought was real isn't real. And what they're seeing is real. They don't believe. And what does that do in our psyche? What does that do in our very beings? It, it causes alarm. Whenever you find yourself in a situation where you're seeing something that you just can't believe, that you're seeing something that doesn't fit your understanding of reality or your understanding of truth, then you become alarmed. That's a very natural reaction as a human being. And that's where the women are. They are alarmed. So as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Um, their truth was in question. And what does the young man in the white robe say in verse 6? Don't be alarmed. He knows that they're alarmed. Over and over again in Scripture, we have this repeated in several different ways. Don't be alarmed. Do not be afraid. Fear not. These are constant reminders that God gives us. Um, don't be alarmed, don't be afraid, fear not, for basically, just like the stone had been rolled away before you even asked, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm up to. There's something bigger going on here, so don't be alarmed. I know you are alarmed because your truth is now in question. I know you are alarmed because what you thought was isn't, but don't be alarmed, as he says. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Do you have that in your passage, Jesus the Nazarene? This is important because this is really the first time in the Gospel of Mark Jesus has been referred to as Jesus the Nazarene. This is like Joseph of Arimathea. It's Joseph, his name, and Arimathea, where he's from. Now it is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene. So it is his first name and then his location, where he was from. He was from Nazareth. And so this is a reference that this angelic being, this young man dressed in white, is giving. And he's saying, you're looking for the human you're looking for that human that died on the cross. You're looking for that human they laid in the tomb. Guess what? He's not here anymore. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. 
he was crucified. So he's not denying that Jesus the Nazarene was crucified. He's not denying that Jesus the Nazarene was laid to rest in that tomb. What he's saying to these women right now who are alarmed because their truth is in question, he's saying the person you're looking for no longer exists as you know it. The person that you're looking for is not here. And so he says, don't be alarmed. Look, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He has risen. That famous um, celebra celebratory um, saying that we put out every Easter. He has risen, and then usually everybody says, he has risen indeed. You know, that, that notion of Easter, he has risen. That Jesus, of the, Na the Jesus the Nazarene that you were looking for, he's no longer here because he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So he's just making reference. He's just confirming them. What he's doing, he's resetting their truth. Because when those women walked in the tomb and they saw that the, the, the tomb was empty, they saw the, the young man in the white robe, they were like, duh, what's going on? Now he's resetting. He understands they're alarmed. He, he understands that they're, they're afraid. He understands that their truth is in question now. Now he's resetting their truth. And so he kind of takes them by the hand and leads them um, mentally, spiritually into this place where they can be present in this moment and not stuck in where they thought they were supposed to be at this time. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So he's resetting their truth. That man is no longer here. That man is gone. He has risen. Jesus the Nazarene has risen. He's no longer here. But, but in verse 7, go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So this young man in the white robe who's resetting their truth now gives them a mission, um, gives them an assignment. They are to go and they're, going to, they're supposed to go and tell the disciples. They're not going to anoint the body. They have all those spices and the oils and everything like that. Those are no good anymore because there's no body to anoint because Jesus the Nazarene has, has risen. He's gone. And so there is this sense of a new mission, a new task. They had come there in that moment to anoint his body. They had come here in that moment to pay um, honor and reverence to Jesus. Now, being that Jesus is risen, they no longer can do that. They need a new assignment. So this young man in the white robe gives them a new assignment there to go and tell the disciples. But notice how Mark gives the direction. But in verse 7, go tell his disciples and Peter. <laughs> now, remember, we believe that Peter is the one that's sharing this information with Mark. Mark was not an eyewitness. Mark was a student of Peter. And so Peter was telling these stories about Jesus' ministry, Jesus' life, about their travels, about their ministry. And Mark was saying to himself, I think I should write this stuff down because this is going to be important for us to have. Someday Peter's not going to be with us, and so we need to have this written down so we have it. And so he was the first one to write the stories down to make a gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so everything in the gospel of Mark has a little bit of Peter in it because of the fact that Peter was the one that was teaching Mark these words. So now it says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Well, why does he include Peter? Well, number one, you can say because Mark was getting his information from Peter, but also too, we have to remember that he said Peter, he signified Peter because Peter's in a really bad place right now. Because remember, last Friday morning, this is Sunday, last Friday morning, Peter was outside of the, the home of the high priest and he was denying Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. He, he basically said, I don't know this man. I'm not with this man. I have no idea who this is. So he denied him three times. Even though Jesus predicted that Peter was going to do it, there's a difference between a prediction of something happening and then something actually happening. So Peter left there crying and Peter left there in distress. And that's the last time we saw Peter in the story. So most likely since Friday morning, Peter has probably been curled up in a corner somewhere in a ball. Um, he's, he's basically um, feeling that he has betrayed his his, his, his Lord and his master that he, he can never come back from this one. He's probably in a very down place. There's even a good possibility he's not physically with the other disciples because he feels so bad about his betrayal. He feels so bad about his denial. And so the, the man, the young man dressed in white tells them to go and get the disciples and Peter. Don't forget about Peter. It's very important. Peter needs to be a part of this too. So go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. Now why Galilee? 
you're right, Galilee is a very important place because Jesus and the disciples are all from the Galilee area. In fact, the majority of Jesus' ministry happened in Galilee. That's where he spent the majority of his time. Yes, he traveled around to different parts. Yes, he did go to Jerusalem. Yes, he did, did go to different areas of the, of the uh, promised land. He even went outside of the promised land in some stories and other accounts that we have. But he stayed mostly in Galilee. That's where the largest percentage of his three years of ministry happened. And so this is them kind of coming home. It's a homecoming. You know, we celebrate homecomings at, at universities and high schools all around this country in September and October. And that's an invitation for people to come back, uh, to come back home. And this is where he, what he's saying to his disciples is that there's going to be a homecoming. And I've already told you about this homecoming. As the young man said, he said, go, um, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, your homecoming. There you will see him just as he told you. And where did he tell you this? Again, let's put your finger there and put a bookmark there. Let's go back to chapter 14, verse 28. Chapter 14, verse 28. Okay. This is where Jesus is predicting Peter's denial. So what is happening here is that the Last Supper has already happened. Um, the, which has been con converted to what we understand now as communion. So he's had this Passover meal with his disciples, converted it into the Last Supper, into communion. They have left that and that, that upper room, and they're heading for uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And on their way, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. And in that prediction, in verse 28, Jesus says this, But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, before Judas betrayed him, before the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion and the death and the burial, Jesus had said to his disciples, after I die, go to Galilee and there's, that's where we're going to meet. So what this young man in the white robe is doing is asking the women to go and to remind the disciples what they're supposed to be doing because the disciples, including Peter, are sitting around saying, what do we do now? What do we do now? What do we do now? It's Sunday. Jesus died on Friday. He was crucified on Friday. A couple days have passed. Now they're, they're really starting to wonder what we're supposed to do. So this is a reminder. They most likely have forgotten that one little phrase in chapter 14, verse 28. They probably forgot what Jesus has said. So this is going to be a reminder for them. So the, the young man in the white robe says, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So in verse eight, trembling and bewildered, trembling and bewildered, we can understand this place. Because remember, um, this is not very long since they have just gone into the tomb. They went in the tomb and they've had this conversation. So just a moment or two has passed. So they're still trembling and bewildered. They're still wondering what's going on. The shock is still setting in to this whole situation. Um, their truth that had been in question, their truth that had, had been in doubt was still in doubt because they're wondering what they're seeing. They're still trying to process this whole thing. And so trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. The women went out and fled from the tomb. Not surprising. I don't know about you, but if I went to a graveyard and I went to a tomb to go in to prepare a body that has been re has recently died, and I see that the tomb is wide open, and I walk into the tomb, and the body's not there, but some young dude dressed in white is there, and he's telling me to go tell the disciples to, I'm freaking out. I don't know about you, but I'm freaking out. I'm trembled. I'm bewildered. And so I'm going to get out of there as soon as I possibly can. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They didn't just leave the tomb. They didn't just mosey along. They fled. They fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So they had this specific direction that they were given. They were supposed to go to the disciples and Peter, and they were supposed to remind them, go to Galilee because that's where he's going to meet you. But they leave the tomb trembling and bewildered, and they say nothing to anyone. They don't tell, they don't go to the disciples, they don't pass go and collect $200, they don't do anything because they were so afraid. So let's take a look for a moment as we bring this passage to a close, let's take a look for a moment on why they were afraid. So we look at this notion of afraid and we can start at the very beginning. They're afraid because when they showed up to do something, when they showed up to take care of Jesus' body, the tomb was, was open. They went into the tomb and they found a young man dressed in white that was there that was announcing to them that Jesus had risen and they were giving, giving them this assignment to go and tell the disciples. This wasn't what they were expected. Um, they, they weren't expecting that. So yes, 
They're afraid because of that. But we need to even take a deeper dive into this concept of afraid. And we've got to take a look at the culture of Jesus' day. In the culture of Jesus' day, when, you came, when it came to the court of law, you had to have two witnesses, at least two witnesses, that agreed for any testimony to be considered true. If you couldn't have at least two witnesses come into agreement, then there's no way a testimony could be true. No way a charge could be, could be found to be true. And so that was the premise legally in Jesus' day. Here's the catch. In Jesus' day, women didn't count as the two. You could have a hundred women come together in Jesus' day and all agree word for word on what their testimony is, and it would never be taken into account because, I'm sorry, don't shoot the messenger. In Jesus' day, women were property. Women were seen as, as lower than second-class citizens. Uh, women had a specific role, and their role was not um, in authority in any way, shape, or form. So here, taking that context of the world, taking that context of their culture, the women have gone to the tomb by themselves. There's no men with them. It's just the three women. They have seen a young man who we're going to say is an angel, is dressed in white, in the tomb. He has made an announcement about Jesus being risen, and he has sent them to go to the disciples and Peter to tell them to go to Galilee to meet them, to meet Jesus. This is, this is what they have been given as an assignment. So now these three women are not only trembling and bewildered because of the fact that what they had expected to see, they didn't. The truth that they thought was true is not. But also, too, now they've been given an assignment that they it's very risky for them to take on this assignment because there is no reason why the disciples and Peter would ever believe them. Because in Jesus' day, women's Wit testimony didn't count. Women's word did not count. And so it would have been very easy for them to go to the disciples and Peter and go to them and tell them what they have just seen, tell them what the young man told them to, to, to say, and they could have looked at them and they would have had every legal right, every cultural right, every societal right as men to look at the women and say, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy and, and you just need to leave. And so they were afraid of how they were going to be received. They were not only afraid about what they had seen, they're not only afraid about that truth that wasn't true anymore, they were also afraid culturally because of the fact that they were women and women did not have the authority. Now this is what is interesting about scripture is that um, Mark wrote this gospel in roughly about 64, so about 30 years or so after Jesus had died and resurrected. And so he could have taken this down to the local print shop and he could have made thousands and thousands of copies of it. He could have contracted a printing company and a publishing company and they could have made a book and, and put it out, right? No. The only way that the Gospel of Mark would ever be reproduced is that someone would take the Gospel of Mark, set it here, get a blank piece of paper here, and copy it word for word. Until Gutenberg's printing press in the 1500s, there was no way for them to reproduce other than handwriting. Well, here we have probably the sentinel, the, the most important point in the story of Jesus, the resurrection, and the only witnesses that we have preserved in history are women. Very easy for the culture to discount this, this testimony. Very easy for the culture to say that's a lie because it's only women that witnessed it. No men witnessed it. So it would have been very easy and it probably would have been in someone's best interest maybe at that time or a later time to say maybe we should add a disciple or two into this mix. Mary, Mary, Salome, Peter, James, and John went to the tomb. And add something in because they wanted to give it validity. They wanted to give it some, some foundation because the women by themselves were not valued as a testimony. But they didn't. They left it just as it is. Over the centuries, it's always been three women that have witnessed the resurrection first and foremost. It's always been the three women. It's always been the very thing the culture looked down upon. The culture did not regard as the ones who had the truth. Again, God is constantly using the foolish to, to shame the wise. And it's this notion of the underdog, it's the notion of the, the, the looked over or the forgotten that Jesus is constantly using and God is constantly lifting up. And here in the resurrection story, it's exactly the same. It's three women who witness it. So when they leave the tomb, they're not only afraid, they're not only bewildered and trembling because of what they've seen, they're bewildered and trembling because of the calling that they've been given, the assignment that they've been given. Uh, they know that if they go and tell this story, there's a very good possibility that no man will ever believe them. 
and that every man that doesn't believe them has every right legally to not believe them, to discount them. And this is why it is so important for us to understand and embrace this trembling and bewilderment and not to judge the women for what they did, but to understand the cultural context. Now, here's the thing that's interesting as we close up is the fact that this is how Mark ends his gospel. We're going to pick up the next week when we're together and we're going to be taking a look at verse 9 and beyond. But verse 9 and beyond are later additions to the manuscript. Maybe they were Mark came by later and added to it. Because he said, I need to bring a completion to the story better than what I did. Uh, maybe it is later and a later edition in Mark's community that Mark's community said, hey, I, I've read these other accounts and there's, there's a, more to the story than just the women leaving and they were afraid. Let's go ahead and add those pieces to it too. We don't know what the story is, but we just know that verse 9 down to the end of chapter 16 is a later edition. And that's okay that it's a later edition. We just go into it understanding it's a later edition. So when we get together next time, we're going to talk about this later edition. We're going to talk about the motivations behind it, and we're going to talk about what it says. But until then, uh, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and we're going to celebrate it in the cultural context that we find it, and that is that women um, don't have the ability to be, to be valid witnesses, but yet the three women are the only witnesses at that, this point, and they have left the tomb afraid. They have left the tomb bewildered. Uh, they have left the tomb trembling. And do you blame them? Because there was a lot riding against them. Not only the question of their reality, their truth has, was thrown out the window, but also, too, their understanding of the cultural context of them being women and trying to bear witness to this most amazing event. Well... Until we get back together again, I pray that you have a wonderful week, that you stay safe and you stay sane. Um, if there was a blessing in this Bible study, I pray that you share this with someone else, uh, for it just might be the thing that they need. So until we get together again next time, celebrate the resurrection. Happy Easter. <laughs>